Let's begin with the second video of the chapter with the topic infectious and non-infectious causes. Whenever we are talking about the causes of diseases, we need to keep two things in mind. The first one is public health factors and the second one is community health factors. The immediate causes of diseases can be distinguished into two distinct types. One group of causes is the infectious agents, mostly microbes or microorganisms. Diseases where microbes are the in immediate causes are called infectious diseases. This is because the microbes can spread in community and disease they cause will spread with them. On the other hand, there are also diseases that are not caused by infectious agents. Their causes vary but they are not external causes like microbes that can spread in the community. Instead, these are mostly internal non-infectious causes. To see an example, the cancers that are caused by genetic abnormalities, also high blood pressure can be caused by excessive weight and lack of exercise. Moving forward, let's now see some infectious agents. The entire diversity seen in the living world can be classified into few groups. This classification is based on common characteristics between different organisms. Organisms that can cause disease are found in wide range of such categories of classification. Some of them are viruses, some are bacteria, some are fungi, some are single-celled animals or protozoans. Some diseases are also caused by multicellular organisms such as worms of different kinds. To see some examples, this first picture shows the virus that causes the disease SARS. The second picture here is of Leishmania, the protozoan organism that causes the disease Kala Azar. The third picture is of an adult round bomb from small intestine. The last picture shows the Staphylococci bacteria that can cause acne. Common examples of diseases caused by viruses are common cold, influenza, dengue fever and AIDS. So these are caused by viruses. Diseases like typhoid fever, cholera, tuberculosis and anthrax are caused by bacteria. Many common skin infections are caused by different kinds of fungi. Protozoan microbes can cause many familiar diseases such as malaria and calazer. All of us have also come across intestinal worm infections as well as diseases like elephantiasis caused by different species of worms. So why is it important that we think of these categories of infectious agents? What is the need to distinguish such agents? It is because these categories are important factors in deciding what kind of treatment to use to treat the diseases. Members of each of one of these groups, viruses, bacteria and so on have many biological characteristics in common. All viruses for example live inside host cells whereas bacteria very rarely do so. Viruses, bacteria and fungi multiply very quickly while worms multiply very slowly in comparison. Taxonomically, all bacteria are closely related to each other than to viruses and vice versa. This means that many important life processes are similar in the bacteria group but are not shared with the virus group. As a result, drugs that block one of these life processes in one member of the group is likely to be effective against many other members of the same group. But the same drug will not work against a microbe belonging to a different group. To summarize it, it can be said that medicines that are developed to treat bacterial uh, diseases can very well work on other bacterial diseases as well. But this medicine will not work on disease that is caused by a virus or a protozoan. Now let's move on to antibiotics. Antibiotics commonly block biochemical pathways important for bacteria to multiply. Many bacteria, for example, make a cell wall to protect themselves. 
the antibiotic penicillin blocks the bacterial processes that builds the cell wall. As a result, the growing bacteria become unable to make cell walls and die very easily. Human cells don't make a cell wall anyway, so penicillin cannot have such an effect on us. Penicillin will have this effect on any bacteria that use such processes for making cell walls. Similarly, many antibiotics work against many species of bacteria rather than simply working against one. But viruses do not use these pathways at all. And that is the reason why antibiotics do not work against viral infections. If we have a common cold, taking antibiotics does not reduce the severity or the duration of the disease. But in case, if we also have a bacterial infection along with the viral cold, taking antibiotics will help. Even in this case, the antibiotic will work only against the bacterial part of the infection and not against the viral infection. So how does this disease spread? That is, we need to study the means of spread of these diseases. Many microbial agents can commonly move from an, an, an affected person to someone else in a variety of ways. In other words, they can be communicated and so are called communicable diseases. Such disease causing microbes can spread through the air. This occurs through the little droplets thrown out by an affected person who sneezes or coughs. Someone standing close by can breathe in these droplets and the microbes get a chance to start a new infection. Examples of such disease spreading through the air are common cold, pneumonia and tuberculosis. Disease can also be spread through water. This occurs if excreta from someone suffering from an infectious disease such as cholera gets mixed with the drinking water used by people living nearby. The cholera causing microbes will enter the new hosts through water they drink and cause disease in them as well. Such diseases are much more likely to spread in the absence of safe supply of drinking water. The sexual act is one of the closest physical contact two people can have with each other. Not surprisingly, there are microbial diseases such as syphilis or AIDS that are transmitted by sexual contact from one partner to the other. However, it must be noted that such sexually transmitted diseases are not spread by casual physical contact. Casual physical contacts include handshakes, hugs, or sports like wrestling or by any other ways in which we touch each other socially. Other than the sexual contact, the AIDS virus can also spread through blood-to-blood -blood contact with infected person from an infected mother to, in, uh, to the baby during pregnancy or through breastfeeding. Now the next topic that we need to learn is organ-specific and tissue-specific manifestations. Different species of microbes seem to have evolved to home in on different parts of the body. In part, this selection is connected to their point of entry inside the body. If they enter from the air via nose, they are likely to go to the lungs. This can be seen in bacteria that causes tuberculosis. If this bacteria enters the body through the mouth, they can stay in the gut lining like typhoid causing bacteria. Or they can also go to the liver like viruses that causes jaundice. But this may not be always true. An infection like HIV that comes into the body via the sexual organs will spread to lymph nodes all over the body. Malaria causing microbes entering through a mosquito bite will go to the liver and then to red blood cells. The virus causing Japanese encephalitis or the brain fever will similarly enter through a mosquito bite but in the end it goes and infects the brain. The signs and symptoms of a disease will thus depend on the tissue or organ which the microbe targets. If the lungs are the targets, then symptoms will be cough and breathlessness. If the liver is targeted, it will be jaundice. If the brain is targeted, we will observe headaches, vomiting, fits or unconsciousness, etc. Now, in addition to these tissue-specific effects of infectious diseases, there will be other common effects too. 
Most of these common effects depend on the fact that the body's immune system is activated in response to an infection. An active immune system recruits many cells to the affected tissue to kill off the disease causing microbes. This recruitment process is called inflammation. As a part of this process, there are local effects that such as swelling and pain and general effects such as fever. In some cases, the tissue specificity of the infection leads to very general seeming effects. For example, in HIV infection, the virus goes into the immune system and damages its functions. Thus, many of the effects of HIV AIDS are because the body can no longer fight off the many minor infections that we face every day. Instead, every small cold can become pneumonia, which is very dangerous. Similarly, a minor gut infection can produce major diarrhea with blood loss, which is life-threatening again. Ultimately, it is these infections that kill people suffering from HIV AIDS. Also, it is important to remember that severity of disease manifestations depends on the number of microbes in the body. If the number of microbes is very small, the disease manifestation may be minor or unnoticed. But if the number is of the same microbe large, the disease can be severe enough to be life-threatening. The immune system is a major factor that determines the number of microbes that survive inside the body. Thus, in this video we learned about some infectious and non-infectious diseases. Also, we learn about some of the modes in which these diseases spread. We also looked at the agents that causes these diseases. And in the end, we looked at organ-specific and tissue-specific manif manifestations of these diseases. With this, I end this video. Thank you.